Billy Loomis was born in 1978 or 1979 as the son of Henry Loomis and Nancy Loomis. Henry was once a lawyer for the movie studio Sunrise Studios, but in April 1974, after helping the studio escape from a lawsuit regarding one of their actresses going missing on set, he left the studio and moved up north to Woodsboro, California, where he met Nancy. Unfortunately, he could not leave his scandalous Hollywood life in the rear view, because after Billy was born, he had an affair with a woman who also fled Sunrise Studios for a quieter life in Woodsboro. Her name was Maureen Prescott. Little did he know, no, Maureen was quite a tramp. She had a secret son named Roman, who was secretly watching and videotaping their broad daylight encounters in cheap motels. When Billy's mother found out about the infidelity, she split up with Henry and skipped town, leaving behind Billy with his father. As Billy describes himself, maternal abandonment causes serious deviant behavior. However, he managed to keep a respectable public persona and seems to be fairly popular in school. He had developed a love of movies, perhaps partially intrigued by his dad's former career at Sunrise Studio, and he has a group of friends who share this passion with him. Because of his obsession with cinema and his ability to cope with abandonment, he's an easy target when he meets Roman sometime in 1994, who is now an up-and-coming music video director who similarly could not get over being forgotten by his mom. He showed Billy the footage of Maureen and Hank having the affair and even helped him plot his revenge. Because Roman was a director looking to get into feature films in the future, his ideas for Billy were very much like something out of a movie, such as having a partner to sell out in case he got caught and finding someone to frame for his crimes. Billy chose his easily peer-pressured friend Stu Mocker to be his accomplice and decided to frame the subject of Maureen's newest affair, Cotton Weary. But getting his revenge on Maureen was not enough. He also wanted to hurt her daughter, Sidney Prescott. Billy is considered an attractive guy in the high school social sphere. Tatum Riley calls him flawless. He was destined to have a flaw. I knew he was too perfect. And other girls at the school gossip about his bubble butts. For these reasons, it's not hard for him to get Sydney to date him, and the relationship started off hot and heavy. But that would change when Billy's plan went into action in September 1995. One night, Billy and Stu stole Cotton Weary's coat and violated Maureen before putting an end to her life. One of them left the house wearing Cotton's coat and made sure to leave in such a way that Sydney got a vague glimpse, enough to identify the jacket and nothing else. Perhaps Billy put the jacket over his head as he loudly left, while Stu made a quieter escape and hung low in a hole in the surrounding woods. A woods burrow, if you will. Then, Billy planted the jacket in Cotton Weary's car, and that was more than enough to get Sydney to testify against Cotton as an eyewitness. But Billy and Stu could not just leave it at that after their success. To learn how Billy took his love of horror movies too far, why he has facial hair in the poster despite him never having that in the movie, how he modeled his killings after his favorite fictional characters, and how he was inspired by a real-life criminal. Stick around to the end of this video. Do you like scary movies? Good. Welcome to Horror History. Billy Loomis was named after two iconic horror movie characters whose movies defined their generation. From the boomers, there's Sam Loomis, Marion Crane's boyfriend in Psycho. Generation X had Dr. Samuel Loomis, the psychiatrist of Michael Myers in Halloween. Billy Loomis would carry the torch, because Scream is a cornerstone for Generation Y. The tradition would be taken one step further in Billy's eventual daughter, whose name is Samantha. She ends up taking on the last name of her mother, but if she had taken her father's name, she would be yet another Sam Loomis. Additionally, Billy would steal elements of both Halloween and Psycho for his own crime spree, which we'll get to. Billy is portrayed by Skeet Ulrich, who is clean-shaven for the entire film, despite what the movie poster would have you believe, and he also wears this shiny leather jacket for some reason. After shooting Scream, Skeet played a part in the 1997 film As Good As It Gets, where his character Vincent has facial hair. This is when they did the promotional shots for Scream, so he couldn't shave and mess up the continuity in As Good As It Gets. Ironically for Skeet, Scream was as good as it gets career-wise. Also, Photoshop did exist at this time, but they decided not to use it, I guess. Screenwriter Kevin Williamson was partially inspired by by the Gainesville Ripper, a criminal believed to have taken eight victims in the latter half of 1990. Other than the fact that many of the victims were students, there isn't much resemblance to Billy Loomis. But what is similar is the relationship between the killers and the media. The media was accused of exploiting Gainesville and creating a moral panic in order to get more attention on their story. However, the killer was doing it all for media attention. He wanted to be a celebrity like Ted Bundy, even breaking into song during his eventual trial. I recall the day the media was feeding him with coverage, and he was feeding them with content. The Gainesville Ripper is not the only criminal we can say this about, but he is the one cited by the writer of Scream. The Scream franchise has Gail Weathers, a tabloid reporter who is unapologetic about her motivation for catching the killer. Do you know what that can do for my book sales? The aspect of the media exploiting the crimes as entertainment also comes from the Gainesville Ripper. During his trial, he claimed to have multiple personality disorder and blamed his crimes on one of the personalities named Gemini. This is a reference to the Gemini killer from The Exorcist 3, the 
spirit of a serial killer who possessed Father Karras. It was revealed that Rowling saw The Exorcist 3 while in Gainesville, possibly hours before he began his murder spree, reported Ron Word from AP News. So that's where Williamson got the idea for Billy Loomis to incorporate his love of horror movie tropes into his plan, and he would do this at nearly every level. But before I unpack that, I've got to talk about Billy's secret girlfriend. After the disposal of Maureen Prescott went off without a hitch, Sydney was experiencing post-traumatic stress, which deterred her from getting physical with her boyfriend. In order to keep her on his hook, he pretends to be patient and understanding with her for nearly a year after the incident. In order to satisfy his teenage libido, he goes behind Sid's back and gets with a girl named Christina Carpenter, a fellow high school student who ends up getting pregnant with Billy's kid. Christina has her own boyfriend at the time who believed he was the father. Billy's affair is just like Hank and Maureen's, and his willingness to follow in his father's footsteps, despite no knowing the damage it can cause is a testament to his narcissism. Billy would not be around to see the birth of his daughter, because he and Stu had plans for the anniversary of Maureen's death in September 1996. Their first target for that year would be Stu's ex-girlfriend Casey Becker, who is also a fan of horror movies and familiar with horror tropes. In order to make their story feel worthy of cinemas, they take inspiration from popular slasher villains at the time. Leatherface, Jason Voorhees, and Michael Myers were all known for wearing a mask, so Billy and Stu did the same. In particular, the events of Scream line up most with Halloween. Halloween, which is Casey's favorite scary movie. In Halloween, Michael Myers wears a randomly selected white mask that he stole from a hardware store. So Billy and Stu do the same by getting these father death masks, which can be purchased at any five and dime store in the States. They wait outside Casey's house one night and stumble upon her new boyfriend, Steve Orth, who's on his way over. So they beat him up, tie him up, and hide him away before making a call to Casey's house. I'm guessing that Billy was the caller using a voice changer device to speak with Casey, not Stu. It's Billy's plan, and he's definitely the wittier of the two. I'm not sure whose phone they might have used, maybe Steve Orth had a cell phone that they stole after abducting him. When Casey picks up, he flirts with her at first, then strikes fear into her when he asks her name. I want to know who I'm looking at. She gets freaked out and starts hanging up on him each time he calls until he threatens to gut her like a fish if she doesn't stay on. He watches the house from his hiding place in front while Stu waits out of sight with Steve Orth closer to the back door. I feel like the fact that there are two ghost faces further supports the through line that they're creating a horror movie. Most of the slashers that inspired them had some kind of supernatural element, and by having two people in the same costume, they could give Casey the impression that Ghostface is teleporting between the front and back of a house. The villain may be ringing the doorbell one moment and placing Steve on the back patio the next. He challenges Casey to a game of horror movie trivia, but the second question is a bit misleading, causing Casey to get it wrong, and Steve to be taken out as a result. The third question, again, plays with the fact that she doesn't know that there are two of them. He asks, what door am I at? And when she refuses to answer, they break in and search the house. In my estimation, Stu is the one to stab his ex-girlfriend, just based on her look of understanding, but not surprised after she sees the killer unmasked. Together, they hang her in a tree and gut her. Later that night, Billy stops by Sydney's house and climbs through her window. She makes him hide from her dad, who comes in and explains when he'll be leaving the next morning and where he'll be staying out of town over the weekend. This time around, Billy is planning to frame Neil for the murder, so overhearing this information is like striking gold, and he remembers it for later. Oh. Cool. He tells Sydney about how he was at home and saw The Exorcist on TV, with all the good stuff censored for television, and it made him think of their relationship, which cooled off after Mrs. Prescott's death. It's significant that he's making an analogy to The Exorcist, because remember, the Gainesville Ripper lifted his story from a movie in The Exorcist franchise as well, which he supposedly watched right before going crazy. He claims he's not trying to rush into sleeping together, and as he leaves, she asks if he'll settle for a PG-13 relationship. His words are empty ones, but he really only has himself to blame for Sydney's hesitancy to get into intimate in the wake of her mom's funeral. He secretly does want to go further with her, but only because it fits into his sick fantasy of living out a horror movie. Everyone knows losing your virginity is a precursor to death in the horror genre. Early the next morning, Billy and Stu capture Mr. Prescott and hide him away in Stu's house, because his parents are out of town as well. They park his car in the woods nearby and also steal his cell phone, which they clone so that each of them can make calls in order to frame him. At school that day, Billy is interrogated by police, just like all Woodsboro High students, and apparently they ask him if he likes to hunt. After class, they're all sitting out in the quad eating grapes and talking about what happened to Casey, and Billy gets mad at Stu for lacking tact when he's discussing how she was gutted. It looks like he's standing up for his squeamish girlfriend, but he's really just playing the part of innocence. That evening, Billy knows Sydney is home alone, having taken care of both of her parents, and hides in her house while she's sleeping upstairs. He calls her using the cloned cell phone, and after asking about her favorite scary movie, challenges her 
her to find him, which eventually leads to him bursting out of her closet and chasing her up to her room, where she barricades herself. Despite going after her with a knife, it is possible that he intended to let her survive this encounter. He doesn't take his chance to cut her throat, and he's almost too clumsy during the chase. Plus, he still wanted to take her virginity before revealing himself as the killer in order to further humiliate her. And he would have wanted someone at some point to survive an encounter in order to tell the tale and elevate the status of Ghostface into a horror icon. For these reasons, he ditches the costume near her front door and goes around to climb into her window in street clothes, pretending to be the concerned boyfriend coming to the rescue. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. How would you know that? You haven't even checked the house yet. To add further suspicion, he drops his phone and Sydney immediately makes the connection. It wasn't very common for a teenager to own a mobile phone at that time, though it was maybe starting to get popular based on Billy's dialogue at the police station. Also, why would the killer abandon his costume before fleeing unless he was planning to go back and be someone else? It doesn't look too good for Billy here, and he's arrested, but lucky for him, his dad was a lawyer, and he begs the sheriff to call him as they book him. Sheriff Burke does call Mr. Loomis, so Billy is able to use his one phone call at the police station to contact Stu, who has the other clone of Neil Prescott's phone and the other voice changer, and instruct him to call Sydney at the Riley household where she'll be staying later that night. In the meantime, he glares at Sydney through the interrogation room window, taking advantage of the intimate small town police station to try to make her feel bad for him and deflect suspicion. After a short interrogation, they move him to a holding cell, and his dad encourages him to keep his mouth shut for now. Sydney. Lawyer, Billy. Hank is an entertainment lawyer, not a criminal defense attorney, but I'm sure he has connections. However, that ends up not really being necessary, because Stu Stu's ghost face call to Sydney works like a charm. Nobody suspects there being two killers. The police also check his phone records, which are clean, so he's released the next morning and even has time to change his clothes and style his hair, but apparently not wash the fingerprint ink off of his hands? Maybe he just decided to leave that in order to make Sydney feel bad. He runs into her in the halls and she's still pretty shaken up. He tries way too hard to convince her of his innocence, despite her confirmation that she no longer suspects him. I know, I know, the cops said I scared him away. You know, it wasn't me, Sid. I know. He called me again last night at Tatum's house. You see? Couldn't have been me, I was in jail. Remember. He also chooses this moment as a really bad time to try to guilt her into taking their physical relationship beyond PG-13, telling her that it's time to get over her mother's death, which understandably pisses her off. Stupid. The only reason he tried to put a little pressure on her here is because they're only a day away from the one year anniversary of the Maureen Prescott murder. So if he's going to take her V card before taking her L card, her life, he's got to do it in the next 40 hours or so. After school, we see Stu leave with Sydney and Tatum, but he does kind of go back towards the school, so it's basically 50-50 on which one of them was the one to kill Principal Hembry and lean over him with the ghost face mask to watch the life leave his eyes. However, I think it's Billy because of this detail. It's daytime when Hembry loses his life. In fact, the janitor is still here, so it's probably right after school, too early to hang the body up at the football field without getting caught. This means he probably had to hide the body in the office somewhere and go back later under the fall of night to put it on display under the goalpost, which by the way is another trait similar to Michael Myers, who liked to use his deceased victims as decorations. Stu was busy hosting his party that night, and Billy doesn't show up until later, so I'm guessing that that was him. But before he would do that, he would have to deal with a fellow student who just knew that Billy was the killer. Billy and Stu touch base again at Bradley Video Store, which is packed with people due to a run in the mass murder section and the fact that people just want to stock up on entertainment because of the citywide curfew set to go into effect that evening. Billy can be seen flirting with two girls in the horror section, another hint about his unfaithfulness to Sydney. When he hears Randy Meeks yell out, Everybody's a suspect! It spurs his curiosity and he goes over to confront Randy just in time to hear this spot on accusation. I'm telling you, the dad's a red herring, it's Billy. How do we know you're not the killer? The two real killers gang up on Randy and tease him, and although Randy really suspects Billy, he can't prove it. Shortly before curfew, someone in a ghost face mask stalks Sydney and Tatum in the convenience store. This was probably Billy, because Stu would likely be setting up for the party at his house that evening. In any event, it seems incredibly risky to just be wearing the ghost face mask around in public when the fear of ghost face is pretty much the talk of the town at this point, thanks to a special report by Gail Weathers. We actually don't see Billy's face again until he shows up at Stu's party, but there is the question of who killed Tatum, who lost her life to a a high quality garage door opener while trying to escape a ghost face who attacked her while getting drinks in the garage. Some have suggested that this was Billy because of how he then approaches the front door from the side as if he had run out the open garage door and sprinted around the outside of the house. It's possible, but if that is the case, he would have had to go the long way around the house counterclockwise. If he was coming from the garage, it would make more sense for him to go the short way around clockwise. 
Plus, plus, in order for him to lock Tatum into the garage, then sneak in and off her, he would have had to go through the party to get to the door that connects the garage to the house. Someone would have seen it. So I think it's Stu who briefly stepped out of the party and killed Tatum while Billy was taking care of Hembry back at the school. Plus, Stu is the one to make this suggestion. Hey, hey grab another beer, would you? Stu offers his parents' bedroom for Sydney and Billy to talk and whatever, and Sydney surprisingly agrees. So the two head upstairs with Billy gut punching his buddy on the way for his lack of subtlety. Or perhaps it's a celebratory smack because their plan is working so flawlessly. Upstairs, Billy apologizes for his behavior lately, but to his surprise, she's feeling contrite as well for shutting him out as she wallowed in grief over the past year. He compares her situation to Jodie Foster's character in Silence of the Lambs, having flashbacks of her dead father. The following interaction explains exactly how Billy sees their lives. But this is life. This isn't a movie. Sure it is, Sid. It's all a movie. It's all one great big movie. And with that, Sid cues him in that she's finally ready, and he plays the part of the supportive boyfriend, making sure she's ready before they get into it. As they get dressed, Sydney asks about who he made his one phone call to at the police station, and he tells her that he called his dad, which puts her off slightly because she realizes that Sheriff Burke was the one to call Mr. Loomis. I was just thinking if it were you, it'd be a very clever way to throw me off track. You know, using your one phone call to call me so that I wouldn't think it was you. She seems to only be joking, but again, he takes her accusation way too seriously, making him look guiltier than he would have been. What do I have to do to prove to you that I'm not a killer? It wouldn't take long to find out, because Stu, now dressed as Ghostface, comes up behind Billy and butchers him with corn syrup packets while his back is turned away from Sid, giving the appearance of real blood. From here, Billy plays dead while Stu chases her through the house, and he doesn't emerge again until he hears Sydney manage to lock Stu out. Pretending to be injured, he falls down the stairs to sell the performance. Strangely, she doesn't notice that there's only one cut on his shirt where he's supposedly been slashed, yet there are two trails of corn syrup. He takes the gun under the ruse that he's gonna use it to protect her, so when Randy butts in and claims Stu's gone mad, Billy reveals himself as the killer by quoting Norman Bates from Psycho. We all go a little mad sometimes. <laughs> no, Billy! He also divulges how he used corn syrup to fake his wounds, which he learned from the prom scene in Carrie. Like an actor giving a press interview, he's discussing all of his influences for the movie that he and Stu are creating. Speaking of whom, Stu appears at the doorway to the kitchen, trapping Sydney in the foyer, and explains the nature of the game. She dies no matter if she wins or loses. As for the rules, Sydney has broken one of them. Now you're no longer a virgin. Ah! A virgin. What? Now you gotta die. Those are the rules. The clock rolls past midnight and into Saturday morning, the one year anniversary of Maureen's death, so they bring out their surprise, Sydney's dad. They place the voice changer and phone back in Neil's pocket to make him look like the lone killer, then they stab each other so they can make themselves look like victims later. Billy is a little overzealous when carving Stu's wounds, going a little too deep, which starts an argument between them. This may be Billy's psycho side taking over his body, or it could be intentional. Now that he has Sydney where he wants her, he doesn't really care if Stu survives or not. Sydney tells them that they They've seen one too many movies, which ties back to the inspiration taken from the Gainesville Ripper, who many people at the time believed was influenced by things he had seen in the media. It goes back to the age-old question, does bad behavior in movies cause bad behavior in real life? This was a hot topic in the mid-1990s. Scream was released the same year that the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was signed in, well, 1996. It standardized the V-chip, a technology that allowed parents to block programming based on the TV rating. There is always a scapegoat for the Karens and Man Karens of the world to blame instead of actually just raising your kids with proper values. Usually the blame goes towards whatever's popular at the time. If Scream were made in the 1930s, it would be radio. In the 60s, it would have been television. In the 80s, rock and roll. In the 2000s, video games. And in the 20s, social media. Now that I think about it, there was a Scream movie in the 20s and its villains did cite social media. Is Sydney right? Has Billy Loomis just seen one too many movies, causing him to snap? There have been a number of studies over the years, resulting in an array of conclusions, which was examined by Craig Anderson, PhD, director of the Center of Study for Violence at Iowa State University. He said, media violence is only one of many risk factors for later aggressive and violent behavior. Furthermore, extremely violent behavior never occurs when there's only one risk factor present. Thus, a healthy, well-adjusted person with a few risk factors is not going to become a school shooter just because they start playing a lot of violent video games are watching a lot of violent movies. I guess Billy was kind of right in a way when he'd rebutted Sid's claim. Now Sid, don't you blame the movies. Movies don't create psychos. Movies make psychos for creating us. The psychos would run into an issue, however, when Stu discovers that the gun is not where he left it, but instead in the red right hand of Gail Weathers. <laughs> Thank you. 
Billy Loomis now found himself to be the one staring down the barrel, which is concerning until he realizes that she has the safety on, giving him the confidence to drop kick her out of the house where she's knocked out against a support beam. However, before he has a chance to finish her off, he's distracted by a bigger problem. Sydney and her father have used the distraction to escape from the kitchen. It's strange that Billy doesn't just pull the trigger on Gil once the shot is lined up. There's no reason that he can't shoot her and then still go look for Sydney and her father. It's very much something that would only happen in the movies, and as we know, it's all one great big movie. However, his vision goes red when he realizes he's no longer the lead character. The tables are about to be turned on him. Sydney calls the house and claims that she's already contacted the police, and Stu becomes useless when he starts to get woozy from all of his cuts. Once again, Billy has himself to blame. He throws the phone at Stu and loses his temper as he ransacks the house, cutting up couch cushions to get his rage out until he gains enough composure to notice the Halloween movie playing on the TV. As I mentioned, Halloween is the template for Scream, and as the main antagonist, Billy is very aware of that. He sees Laurie Strode hiding in the closet and realizes that Sydney must be doing the same. However, before he can act, she strikes first by stabbing him with an umbrella, causing him to drop the knife and the gun. He's saved when Stu uses the last of his energy to bum rush her, but she's able to put him out of commission in the living room. Randy comes back too, so Billy swiftly knocks him back out with a punch to the face and pins down Sydney, telling her to say hello to her mother. She jabs a finger into his wound, causing him to scream out, and just before he can thrust his knife down onto her, a recently reawakened Gail Weathers shoots him in the chest. I guess I remember the safety that time, you bastard. This might have been enough to kill the normal person, but I like to believe that Billy was so motivated to make his life a movie that he held on just a little bit longer so he could have that one last scare moment that he had seen in so many of his favorite films. Sydney is ready for it though and delivers a headshot to put an end to the terror that plagued Woodsboro over the last year. But while the threat of Billy Loomis may have been gone, the horror would live on. Early in this video, I described how Billy's name was inspired by a Halloween character whose name was inspired by a psycho character. This lineage was intentional. Billy was inspired by horror movies of the past, but now that he'd modeled his life after a horror movie, he would go on to inspire horror movies of the future. And many people would be exposed to his story when it was published in Gail Weathers' book, The Woodsboro Murders, later that year. The book served as source material for a movie, Stab, which came out the following year in April 1997. Luke Wilson played the part of Billy Loomis, and he was an even more obvious killer than Skeet Ulrich was in Scream, because in their world, Stab is a true crime movie, so everyone already knows it's him. Around that same time, Billy's daughter, Samantha Carpenter, would be born. And also around that time, his mother would go undercover as a reporter named Deborah Salt, after gaining 60 pounds and getting a makeover, in order to try to get revenge on Sydney for killing her son. You killed my son! And now I kill you, and I can't think of anything more rational. But well, the problem is, you walked out on that son, so I don't really get why you care now. I talked about several risk factors needing to be present in order to make someone go psycho, so I think we can safely add a genetic predisposition to the list for Billy. Mrs. Loomis isn't successful in getting revenge on Sydney either. She seems to have that same cinematic reluctance to pull the trigger when she probably should that her son does. Mental illness continues to run down the family to Samantha, who has to take antipsychotics to calm her disturbing visions of her father, which started when she first discovered she was related in December 2010 when she was 13 years old. Stab became a huge franchise, leading to many more little freaks trying to follow in the footsteps of Billy Loomis. At some point in the 2010, Sunrise Studios released a Stab Blu-ray box set, which included a special documentary called Stab the True Story, where the real Billy Loomis was featured. No, you can't actually watch that, but honestly, you kind of just did. What you can watch is my comprehensive analysis on the entire Stab franchise. Just click on that video on the left. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell and select all notifications, and I will see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.